Welcome to the first ever Women in Music um, event. The Women in Music program's main goal is to empower young women to be involved in music and combat the issue of an overwhelmingly male representation presented in most musical styles. Through these events, we hope to help broaden a young woman's knowledge of women in the music industry. Tonight, we'll hear from an inspiring trailblazer, Susan Slaughter. In 1971, Susan Slaughter became the first woman to earn a principal trumpet position in a major American Symphonic Orchestra. She has been the principal trumpet player at both the Toledo Symphony and the St. Louis Symphony, and has remained a part of the St. Louis Symphony for 41 seasons. She has, she has earned six Grammy Awards and one Edison Award throughout her career. Susan is an artist, was also an artist activist in promoting women's inclusion in the music world. In 1990, she created the International Women's Brass Conference, which provides opportunities for female brass musicians to learn, develop, and become inspired. We are so excited to have her here today. I'm especially excited as I am also a trumpet player. This is very important to me because as a brass musician, I have experienced the struggles that many young women are facing today with the lack of inclusion of women in the music industry, specifically in high school. This lack of inclusion and underrepresentation is why I created this program in hopes that young women will find their voices and find their own models such as Susan Slaughter. Before we begin, a few reminders. Please keep your mask on in proper fashion at all times for the safety of you and others. Also, please silence your cell phone as we want to minimize the number, we want to minimize the number of distractions. Also, at the end of the speech, there will be a Q&A, so please do not hesitate to ask any questions. We want you to be as involved in this as possible. Also, when the event is over, we ask you to please fill out a survey on the website, which is on your brochure, or if you're on the live stream, it is on, it is in the description of the video. This survey will help cater to future events for you and to help our program thrive. Please take this time to fill out this very short survey. Lastly, I want to thank you all so much for coming, both in person and virtually. I cannot put into words how grateful I am. Also, a disclaimer for those on the live stream, our video may not be working at all times, so, but you will definitely be able to always hear the event. Um, thank you again, and now let us hear some of these slides. Okay, I could probably project, and uh, you would hear me, but with the mask, I'm not certain Lots of things are lost with our masks, such as reading lips, <laughs> seeing smiles. So I'll try to smile with my eyes. But uh, anyway, thank you, Mackenzie, for that wonderful introduction. I think I should build me up a little too high, but <laughs> we'll see. And uh, you can see what she did up here. Plus, I'm sure you picked up the little program when you came in. This is very creative. And uh, I wish I had these artistic ability, art-wise, to do things like this. But thank God there are people like Mackenzie and some of you who are very gifted and to do things like this. The next speaker, Maria Lane Bernard, is the executive director, if you don't know, of the St. Louis Symphony. Now, I think, <laughs> I think the title has changed over the years. I think she's now the president of the executive director or something like that. Uh, but she, I think, did her degree in law and how she ended up in uh, music, I don't know. But I think that's going to be a very interesting lecture and I'm hoping that you all will be able to come back and hear her speak because how long gets from, excuse me, how long gets from point A to point B, I think is always interesting. Now, I wasn't certain. See how this works because my glasses fall down, okay? <laughs> when I received the invitation from McKenzie to come and speak, I wasn't, uh, she wanted me to talk about my career, and I, in a very young age, wanted to be a performing musician. I just felt like that's what I wanted to do. And then I always thought too, if I uh, got tired of performing, then I could also could fall into teaching and doing other things. So as a performance major, I was very, very focused in my music career. So um, I 
I'm going to talk a lot about that and what it took to achieve that, uh, and then try to broaden it so that you can learn about other options in, uh, in the music business. So I began playing the cornet. Do you know the difference between a cornet and a trumpet? Okay, everybody's hands went up. No, nobody's hands went up. Oh, there's Thank you. Okay, well, the trumpet is a much longer version. We kind of call it a cylindrical board. Uh, there are fewer bends. You have a long lead pipe, etc. The cornet is a little more squatty, or a lot more bends, and it makes for a um, mellower sound. Plus, it's shorter and easy to hold when you're 10 years old. <laughs> so I started on the cornet. And uh, it was uh, interesting because I was 10 years old, went to a country school, there were 60 in my class, and we did not have a music program. And then suddenly, I decided to start one. So that's, that was very fortunate for me because probably had we not had a band, I would not have chosen the trumpet. I probably wouldn't have chosen anything. I was playing the piano at the time. And <clears throat> I think things just work out when they're supposed to be a certain way. So they uh, hired a woman to be the first band director. And I took lessons from her. And then everything, every teacher after that was a man. But uh, early on, I was encouraged that women were in music. I didn't know any better, you know. Back in the 60s, we're talking about way before probably anyone sitting here was born. <laughs> so how many of you play an instrument? Wow, fantastic. And how many of you took lessons with your band director? Yeah, yeah. So see, we have a lot in common. That's what I'm trying to find. What do we have in common? So we have a lot in common. So. Uh, I grew up actually in a very small town of about 2,000 people. And I grew up on a farm, so I wasn't even in the city, per se. Uh, and here at Webster, Kirkwood, Normandy Parkway, East St. Louis, there's a very, very, very long history of producing great musicians. St. Louis has a fantastic history. When you, when you think of other cities like New York or New Orleans, they have a great history also. But we are right there with them. So be proud of your heritage. Be proud and thankful that you have good music programs in these areas and other areas too. I didn't mention all of them. But um, so the size of the city or the school really has very little to do with your success. It really has to do a lot with your concentration, your determination, that this is what you want to do. So if you pick up an instrument to play in band and decide that you want to take private lessons so you can advance a little more quickly and do things properly from the beginning, it's really a challenge when you get further along in your career and you discover you're holding the instrument upside down, and then you have to turn it around and get used to doing that. So I mean, you know, it's a ridiculous example, but you've, you've got the point. So if you do take some lessons with your band director, and what happened to me, I got to be a junior in high school, and the band director said, I can't teach you anymore. Uh, you're beyond my skill knowledge. He was a trombonist that particular band director, excellent player, but he had taken me as far as he could. So then he told me to contact the symphony in Indianapolis. I was grew up in Indiana, so that first trumpet in the symphony had a really outstanding student and put me with that student. So I had a one hour trumpet lesson every week and a one hour theory lesson, so two hours of lessons. And uh, that, that really, was made it easy for me in a sense because when I went to college, everybody else was struggling, let's say, with theory. Uh, it was a breeze for me. Now I can't say everything else is a breeze, but theory, whenever one of my friends were saying, oh my goodness, I just don't get this, and I was like, oh, it's just a one, four, five.
wife for it. I, I don't know. It's, it seems easy to me. <laughs> so I was very, again, very blessed to be directed by my band director to go take lessons with someone else. So if that happens to you, that's, that's a good thing. It doesn't mean the band director doesn't want to teach you anymore. It means the band director recognizes your talent and is suggesting that you move to another teacher who can, who's more of an expert in that instrument. So we have that together. Did, that can happen to us. But one thing that's kind of interesting in my career, because it started back in the 60s, there were no women playing in major symphonies on a brass instrument. Now, why was this? Well, uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons that it might have been uh, happened, but uh, I think one of the things that uh, you need to understand is when you apply for a position on a musical instrument, you write a letter of inquiry. You know, I hear you have an opening for trumpet. I'd like to come and audition. Uh, sincerely, Susan Slaughter. Well, as soon as they would see the name Susan, they said, well, women can't play the trumpet. We all know that. So they would set me aside and wouldn't invite me. So in 1967, I'm showing my age here, I finished college and I was ready to go out into the world and make my mark. And uh, my teacher said, well, here are 30 openings. Send letters to all these people. And I signed them all, Susan Slaughter. I was invited to three auditions, one in Milwaukee, one in well, North Carolina, they came to Indiana University, but I didn't have to go there. And then one in Toledo, Ohio. So the one in Toledo, Ohio, uh, well, you, let me just back up for a second. So if you were to interview for a job with IBM, you probably would go and have an interview talking to the person who's going to hire you. On with music in a performance situation, especially for an orchestra, you have to play your instrument. There is no talking. And in those days, <laughs> there was no curtain. So when I went to play in uh, Toledo and Milwaukee and North Carolina, it was just the conductor and sometimes the personnel manager. Do you walk out on stage, they have sent you a list, and they tell you from the list what you're supposed to play. You don't, you, you don't pick and choose what you want to play. They tell you what they want to play. Now, after that first year, and I only got three invitations to uh, come and audition, I changed how I signed my letters and I changed it to S.J. Slaughter, my first and middle initials. And I got invited to everything else after that. So that's just the way it was back then. And you have to figure out how to maneuver around it a little bit. I didn't feel like I was lying. These are my initials. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's how that happened. So I was hired to play principal trumpet in the Toledo Symphony. And uh, about two years later, there was an opening in St. Louis. Now, all the people that were graduate students when I was a freshman at IU, Indiana University, had gone into military bands, and their four years were up, and were coming out, auditioning, you know. So I got to St. Louis, and I saw all these gentlemen that were really great players, and I thought, well, I know one of them is going to win the job, so. I went out on stage and played the best I could, and, and they said, oh, uh, can you stay for the uh, finals? And I said, well, when are they? And they said, oh, three this afternoon. I said, oh, I, I've got a 7 p.m. rehearsal in Toledo, so no, I can't stay for the finals. So they said, let's see if the conductor's in, in the hall. So they went out, and Walter Suskin was the music director at the time. He was in the hall. And Leonard Slatkin. Now I know you know Leonard Slatkin's name. 
you may not remember Walter, but you know Leonard. And they came down, and in St. Louis, now they had a committee. They had nine people, and a combination of trumpets, trombones, horns, and then maybe a string player or a flute player. It's just a, a combination of various people from the orchestra. And uh, they listened, and uh, I guess I can tell this now, because John's no longer in the orchestra. His name is John San Ambrosio. He was the principal cellist for years and years and years. And John was a member of that committee. And he said, well, I saw a woman come on stage, and I decided it was a good time to go get a cup of coffee. He said, well, so I walked to the back of the hall, and I thought, well, I better listen to a couple of notes. And so after 15 years, he told me this story. And he said, uh, well, I have to tell you, I, I was going to leave. And uh, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just hear a couple of notes. And he said, you made me sit down. So the rest of them that had gone to the back of the hall, came back in and sat down and listened to my audition. Later that night, I got a call and said, that, you know, this is March 1969. They wanted me to come to be the principal trumpet in St. Louis Symphony. So, and actually, I came as fourth trumpet, and then around 72, I think, is when I was named principal trumpet. So, you know, the auditions committees, as I mentioned, is made up by various people from the orchestra, and it's also people who are elected by the orchestra. And so, a number of names are put up, and people vote for them, and that's how they form the committee. And usually, the orchestra musicians are smart enough to know that if it's a brass opening, you want mostly brass people on the committee. If it's a uh, violin opening, you want mostly string players with a couple of, maybe a flute and brass person. So it's very interesting to listen to the auditions, especially when it's not your instrument, okay? The, uh, the conductor is usually a person who has a fairly good knowledge about all the instruments, but not necessarily expertise in all the instruments. And, and how, how could we? Could we all learn to uh, play the violin as well as it's a furlan? No, he spent years and years and years focusing just on that instrument. So the same for our first and second violins. If it's an opening in the violin section, the con the uh, Conductor needs to listen to those people about the person they're looking at to hire and when to get to the final stage. So the candidates play behind the screen now. That came about when Leonard became music director around 1977. Why do you think we use a screen? I'm hard of hearing, so you have to really speak up. Yeah. Like without any biases. Right, so there can be no bias. At oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Okay, do you agree with that answer? Oh, yeah, I do. So, it, it's interesting to me because I think we all have unknown biases, okay? For instance, I may look at the color of these chairs and say, well, I wouldn't have chosen that. And there's nothing wrong with this color of this chair. But maybe I would have wanted something brighter or lighter or lighter. But there's nothing wrong with this, you know. So one of, one of the times we had a violinist who played great, a great audition, opening for a second violin, and the conductor said, again, the, the committee said, well, we think this is the best, and the conductor said, yes, I know, that person's the best, but it was a woman. He said, she doesn't look very attractive. Well, we don't need people who are attractive in the orchestra. We need people who play great. And this is the best player. And this is who we recommend. And the conductor said, yes, I agree. Yes, go ahead and hire her. But it, she was a phenomenal player and since retired from the orchestra. But uh, he was a little biased about how a person looked. Who knows, maybe they got up in the hotel hair dryer didn't work that day. You know, there's a lot of reasons why someone may or may not look as attractive as you think they should. And they played behind the screen. 
when you come out behind the screen, it is assumed that that person is good enough to be a member of your section, member of the orchestra. Now, we usually hope to have four or five people in, from which to choose, and then you want the, like, the very best one of those four or five. And that's how it is. So you hear about people making the final round, and then so-and-so didn't get the job. Well, well, well why was that? Maybe the, one of the other people started elevating their playing, getting a little bit better each time, a little bit better, and the other person maybe got a little tired, not as attentive to details, and suddenly they got the job and you didn't. So it can be something really, really small, and yet that's what you're looking for, the person who can elevate their playing and keep your attention. All right, so in the final round, we take away the curtain. They play a solo with the piano accompaniment. They have about 10 minutes to rehearse with the pianist. And we listen uh, to them play a solo, then we listen to them play the final excerpts. And to be honest with you, I'll always be indebted to those who listen to me play with their ears. With their ears and not their eyes, because there was no curtain when I was auditioning. So, I was hired to be the principal trumpet in 72, and now I have to figure out how to keep the maestro happy, how he wants me to perform the music, or she. In those days, it was just about all male conductors and conductors. The nice thing is, if we're performing a standard piece, standard literature, and what do you think I mean by that? Standard literature. Brahms, Beethoven, Sibelius. These are pieces that have been recorded over and over and over. So it's very easy to find a recording for these pieces. But if you have a piece of John Adams, Joan Tower, uh, tons of other composers that are contemporary composers now, you don't have that guideline to, to draw upon. You also sometimes don't even have a score that you can look at because the ink's still drying. So if you ever commission a piece from a composer to be played by the band here or the orchestra, don't be shocked if you get the piece and, and then the music at the last minute. Because sometimes, I, I don't know, composers seem to procrastinate. No complaint, but a new piece has come sometimes the, one of the hardest things to prepare. You don't have any kind of a map to go on, so that's one of the things. Now the conductor is another uh, area that certainly you consider for a career, but just think about it. What, what view do you usually have of the conductor? This is it. They come out and bow, and then that's all you see. But I thought maybe you'd like to see what the musician sees from the other side. So perhaps you played in an orchestra or band in which you, most of you raised your hand, and, and that was for fun. And but the conductor had then the challenge of getting an ensemble to learn to play together when their skill levels were extremely varied. So you have junior high kids coming in to the uh, freshman band or the senior band, however you want to say it, and the seniors who've been there for four years and they're quite a bit better. It, it's, it's a challenge to bring all of them together. But in an orchestra, the level of every musician is the same. And we have the concert master, but believe it or not, there are people in the first violins that play better than the concert master. The concert master sometimes displays skills of leadership or wants that responsibility when everybody else just wants to be in the section and not have to work that hard. Because you have to be sometimes a psychologist with their section because they have, you know, life happens and you have to uh, help them get through those, those things that, that happen. But uh, David Hale has been here a long time and he does an excellent job of, of doing that and he's an excellent violinist. But there are actually people in the section that play better than David. So 
And especially when you think about, you come along, okay, so I studied with people who were really good teachers, and I have taken everything they know, learned some new things on my own, and passed those on to the students that I have now. Those students take everything they know, and hopefully they're starting up here because of all the knowledge I've been able, to, or someone else has been able to share with them, and they start up here in the job where I am now down here. In other words, they've gotten better to me because they've had an excellent teaching course, applied themselves and practiced. So that's how the orchestra gets better and better. It keeps growing and new and new people come in and they're better players than me. Now the person who replaced me is Karen Blisnick. Have you all uh, heard her play at the symphony? Terrific. She's a terrific player. Uh, she had a car accident about two years ago. Somebody had stolen a car, rear-ended her, and I guess before the bag could uh, open, airbag, her face hit the steering wheel. So she's been out of commission for a couple of years, trying for the, that nerve and everything in her, in her lip to re, regenerate, I guess is the best way to think of it. So hopefully she'll be able to get back this fall, but she's been working very hard to, to uh, overcome that injury. But she is a phenomenal player. So if you get a chance to hear her, go. And if you want to go backstage and talk to her, people will talk to you. You just have to figure out which door they leave by. Leave by the Del Mar door, or the door that's on the south side. Once you figure that out, you can catch them after the concert. So, yeah, don't tell them I told you that. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the uh, conductor is very, very, very uh, privileged to have this level of, of players. Just think about it. They just put a beat down, and everybody plays because they've all learned the parts, come in prepared for rehearsal, and all he or she has to do is balance and put their ideas into play and express those ideas, okay? So I brought something I thought might be a little bit of comic relief. There's a piece called Ride of the Valkyries by Wagner, Richard Wagner, and it's in three since you all have had musical training, and it goes like this. So you'll get to see the face of the conductor. In this particular uh, DVD, I purchased a raspberry cider because it was like a play along. You could watch the conductor, get your heart out, play your part. <laughs> it was like my way of uh, staying in touch with the orchestra. So anyway, I decided, well, this would be a good example uh, of a conductor, and uh, I don't know uh, how many opportunities you've had to, to look straight into the uh, face of a professional conductor, other than your band director, your orchestra conductor, here or in the state orchestra. Oh. Oh. Nice music, no picture yet. So, am I ready now? Oh, sure, go. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Watch the face. Watch the arms, the hands. The horns are playing. Why don't you do 
several movies, the music that was being recorded. So Leonard has a tremendous amount of knowledge about uh, not only music, but movie music, pop music, and all of that comes uh, in very handy when you're interpreting, especially some of the new music that's being written. So that is your view of the conductor from the other side. I hope I didn't ruin it for anybody who was thinking about being a conductor. The other thing uh, is, uh, when you're playing, I don't know if you've thought about this, but everyone here has seen a horse race, haven't they? The Kentucky Derby, and I, maybe when you put the horses in the gate, and uh, it's just like, rare to go. Well, um, that's kind of the way you feel when you're getting ready for a big entrance. 
uh, like for instance, pictures on exhibition, Mahler Symphony Number no. Five, both start with solo trumpet. If I had a complaint about conductors, you know, think about on stage, and you're ready to go. You're in that gate. You're ready to go. Think about it. Think about the conductor. Shake the hand, of concert master, and they're talking. And honest to goodness, I think they're talking about where they're going to have dinner. <laughs> you are ready to go. <laughs> You're just trying to pace yourself and so you can play and get your breath that you want and you do the phrasing. And I always think, come on, come on, let's go, let's go. Just once, just once. <laughs> because I, this guy did it every night. I was a little impatient. So I do have a bad side. Uh, he came out, shook the hands, chanted for a minute, stood up on the stage, and as soon as he opened his door, I started without him. <laughs> and he's, you know, it was the pictures, you know, he's, bum, 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 bum. I just started, I was starting with him. <laughs> but the next night, he didn't talk to the concert master so much. <laughs> All right, so I was a bad, bad girl there. Okie dokie, let's see here. All right, a career, a career in music can be very rewarding. And you don't have to play an instrument. Okay? That's the good news. You can conduct, like you just saw. Conduct for a movie, even like you just saw. You can sing. Become an orchestra manager, a personnel manager, work with volunteers. Create programs for education of children, adults, and on and on. When the orchestra would go on tour to New York City and play Carnegie Hall, it's just a big deal, because uh, you're in New York for all the orchestras from around the world come to play Carnegie Hall. It's one of the best halls in the world. And also, we want to get a review from the New York Times or the Post and whatever other reviewers are there. It's a very important uh, to fundraising, really, especially here in the States. In Europe, a lot of their orchestras receive funding from the government, so it's not like, uh, not quite the same. Uh, we struggle to have uh, people uh, give us donations for the orchestra, and uh, in Europe, they can count on a certain, uh, it's, it's considered a government job, is, is what it really is. So when they retire, they give a government so Carnegie Hall or Europe, or we play <clears throat> great halls over there or Japan. There are just so many areas that need to be managed because things that you may not think of now, like tour details, who's going to hire the bus drivers, who's going to hire the hotels. Uh, all of these areas contribute to each musician's ability to perform the very, very best. And it's because so many people who are in the background would probably never get any recognition out front, like the conductor or the orchestra, that make all this happen. You look at opera theater, have any of you gone to opera theater? It's right next door. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, yeah you, you really should try to do that because it, someone builds this evening. Someone sets up the stands and music, you know, music stands and chairs. Uh, it's just so many areas that can involve you in music, whether, whether you're uh, interested in playing your instrument or interested in just being around music that's happening. Opera theater is a big, because you have so many other details that we don't have to deal with in the orchestra. So, one of the most important areas is right here where all of our dreams begin, right here in high school. So I've met your band director, the orchestra director, and I know that uh, he has some great ideas for what you maybe could do, and just talk to him, you know, ask him questions, and, and think of, make a list, and ask for some time and just say, what could I do? What do you think I might be able to be good at? And that doesn't mean that you have to do that, but you need to understand and, and figure out your areas of opportunity. Okay? So that's where I began. 
So let's just say here, let's start with McKinsey. What are your goals? Um, as a musician, or as a musician, or in general? <laughs> uh, how about you want to make it general, or whatever you want to share with us? I'll, I'll do musician. As a musician, I just want to be able to play the best music that I can, and then also be able to experience and broaden like the, my musical knowledge. Okay, could you all hear that? Good. Get better ears to me. I can. Anybody else? Come on over here. You're shaking your head off. Black chair. Oh, that's me. Uh, <laughs> you play an instrument? I, I'm in musical theater, so my goals are to uh, improve my performance and just have as much fun as I can on stage. Awesome. All right. Anybody else? How about CPC up there? No. Okay. Anyone else? I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we all have goals. Uh, my goal right now is not, not to make foolish statements, <laughs> to uh, try to be interesting and uh, try to make sentences that make sense. <laughs> so It, the, the last thing I think I want to talk about is, uh, not the very last thing, but a music career provides you with an opportunity to bring incredible joy to many people. And it really doesn't matter if it's music in a church, which I loved working with the church choir. And what I loved about it was convincing them that they could do something more difficult than they thought they could do. And so, again, helping them elevate their level of, of singing. Uh, so, live concerts, YouTube, you ever watch any of the things on YouTube? It's incredible. Radio, of course, is maybe not as important a venue as it was in years past, but it's still there. And you could also become a composer. I only mentioned that briefly, but right now, you can make, you can create a piece, put it on the internet, and they can hear it all over the world. Whereas in the past, we'd write a piece, hopefully you could get some conductor's attention that they would agree to perform it, or at least look at their score. And it, the internet changes all of that. You can put your piece out there. You can even have the computer play the piece, although the sound's horrible. It's still better than nothing. It gives you a chance to let people hear what you can do with your uh, composing uh, skills. Now, this, this is very important to me. Are there any Cardinal fans here? Do you think we're going to make the wild card? Yeah. Do we have, we still have a little chance, don't we? If we could win every game and everybody else loses their games. <laughs> we could have it. So, I'm going to hold out for it, but uh, yeah, I'm hoping they can do that. One of, one of the things that I, I had the uh, opportunity to do was play the National Anthem for several years and the Cardinal Games. In 1991, the uh, Faye Vincent was the, uh, uh, let see sorry, having a moment here, oh, baseball commission, there we go. It was in April. He came to a game. And Marty Hendon was a gentleman who was in charge of setting up all the PR stuff and the giveaways and things like that. So when you're performing, you tend to get kind of into a little focused area. So Marty came out and said, Would you like to meet Faye Vincent? Uh, I said, uh, Sure, if you want me to. Because I wasn't even listening, in a sense, to what he was saying or who it was. No, 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 nice to meet you yesterday. Played the National Anthem, enjoyed the game. Went home, next week, Faye Vincent called and said, uh, I'd like Susan to play the National Anthem for one of our World Series games in October. So I had the privilege of doing that, and uh, that was uh, 
his family claim to fame in the sense other than being principal trumpet in the St. Louis Symphony. But I really think uh, my greatest achievement has been to create an organization called the International Women's Brass Conference. I gave you a newsletter, and I've got two or three extras here, uh, if you want, want one of your own. And why did I do that? Uh, back in the late 80s and the early 90s, I was teaching in the Grand Tetons in Wyoming, and uh, these young ladies that play brass instruments, so there were several of them, and we'd go out to eat or talk after a, a concert or rehearsal. I said, oh, do you know, for instance, Gail Williams, and she probably said, well, I, I met Gail once, but you know, I don't really know her. Do you know Marie Spitzialli in the Cincinnati Symphony? But now there were several women who were beginning to win jobs in orchestras because of the curtains being up. So, uh, I said, well, again, I, I, I know of Maria, I've known of her for a long time. I've never called her, I've never talked to her, and that didn't make any sense to me. So then we began talking, when did we need to have our own conference, our own brass conference? And so the, one of the reasons we're talking about that was we had the International Trumping Guild, but they weren't featuring any women performers, except me and one other lady, Barbara Butler. Then they have the Trombone Association, and they weren't featuring any women performers, and there were plenty of them, too. Word was a little different, and I think I figured out why, but uh, for years I wondered why there were so many women in the French horn sections and orchestras, and Gail Williams and I had a chance to visit and uh, we were actually were interviewed on the radio station, and she talked about being uh, raised on a farm. <laughs> and I tease her about this because they had a phone in the barn, but we did not have a phone in the barn, so they were way ahead of me. Uh, and she said when she went to Oberlin, no, not Oberlin, Ithaca College, there were 18 horn players, 15 of them were women and only three were men. I said, oh, for crying out loud, it must have been, maybe the horn was not a very attractive instrument to men, and, and gals picked it up and run, ran with it, so to speak. So they had a little bit more equal representation in the horn society when they would do their conference. They would have half women and half men give presentations. So that, that was really a way ahead of the time. So, they didn't need this so much, but all the other instruments, trumpet, horn, trumpet, trombone, tuba, euphonium, really needed a place where we could present women performers that did not get a chance to be recognized by the other. So I thought, okay. I sent out a survey, and I said, uh, do you think we need this? And I sent out 1,500. If you ever do a survey, uh, a 3% response is considered outstanding. That's what I'm told by people who do surveys. And so when I got 500 back out of the 1,500, and out of that, 492 said, oh yes, please do this, we need this. I felt like I had a mandate, and then I had to try to figure out somehow how to create an organization how to name it, you know, 501 C3, et cetera, et cetera. So that was in 91, and by 1993, we had our first conference. It was, well, if, if you could understand this, and I don't know that it's any different now in a sense, but as a brass player and a woman brass player, you couldn't really appear weak. So if I needed to talk about something, talk to my male colleagues in the brass section. I had to talk to somebody in the woodwinds or somebody in the strings uh, and see what, what they would say. Well, in this conference, because we were mostly women, not all women, men were welcome to come, men who could compete in competitions, etc. And we also featured a few male artists because we didn't want to do the same thing to men that were being done to us. So, Anyway, uh, 
people could talk about things that bothered them. One of the things was, what do you do when you're pregnant and you're just a few days from going to the hospital? Sorry, guys, I don't think you can comment on that. But one gal said, well, I played Mahler 5, and the next morning I had my baby. <laughs> and so she could tell what was happening on stage and blah, blah, blah. So there's just some things that, uh, that everybody could share and say and not have it come back on them and go, you're a sour pussy or you don't, you don't need to, uh, you don't need this, you don't need that. Why are you saying this? Why are you saying that? You know, we could talk to each other and feel safe. So that was 93. In 1996, I formed the Monarch Brass, an uh, all women's uh, brass group, large brass ensemble. Uh, monarch being the butterfly, because the butterfly looks very fragile. So I think some people look at women as being fragile. And yet, think about it. Butterfly flies from here to Mexico. I can't do that. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's uh, what, we, what we did. And the organization just keeps growing. Uh, I think we had about 300 at our first uh, conference. And that attendance kind of stayed the same until the last one we just had in Phoenix, Arizona, or Tempe, really. And uh, we had probably about 600 people come to that one. Uh, more and more men are coming to the conference, uh, and they feel very, very welcome, because we welcome everyone. And we want them to learn that women can play in the brass instruments very well. We already know that men can do that. And uh, it's an it, it, opportunity to try to share what we can do and what we've learned. And, and uh, I've seen a marked difference in the attitude of, of my male colleagues, because I think the academic scene has changed some minds. So that is uh, basically most of my uh, presentation. You have the newsletter here. Here's the most recent. I don't know if you can see it. It has more color now. Naturally, I am not a uh, art person in terms of creating things like this or like created. So uh, it's getting really very nice. And then there was a gentleman who uh, wrote a magazine out of London. And he had uh, uh, featured brass bands. So brass bands is very big in Europe. And we have several groups now around the uh, United States of uh, brass bands, Battle Creek being one, Kalamazoo, uh, Brand in Kentucky, et cetera, all over the place. So he wanted to start feature and showing women brass players. And so I'll put it down here so you can come up and look at it. This is a picture of myself, Carol Don Reinhardt, who's American but went to Europe and had a solo career over in Europe. Over years, Reese Fitzgerald, uh, Carrie Schaefer, and the middle in the Marine outfit is uh, Abby McKay, and then Karen Blisnick, our own principal trumpet here in St. Louis. So he put that together. He took a picture of the Monarch Brass trombone section at another conference, and a, a group that formed themselves because they met in Monarch Brass called Stiletto, an old women's group. And they're already wearing red stiletto shoes. <laughs> so that is uh, what can happen. You know, again, I'm just this little kid from McCordsville, Indiana, who just tried to do the right thing, uh, practiced my tail off, so to speak, uh, had some goals. I wanted to play in an orchestra, and it didn't matter what chair. How did I end up as principal? Uh, I think divine intervention, to be honest, because it was not a time when women would be given that opportunity. So what else could it have been? OK, uh, ready to offer some questions? Am I getting the cuts? No, no, you're good. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Now, I have to tell you, I am, is OK uh, if I walk around? Yeah. No, yes, OK. Yeah, of course. <laughs> 
I have uh, a hearing loss, so that's why I'm going to come out here so I can hear you better. Um, and, uh, of course, sitting in front of the St. Louis Symphony drum section <laughs> did not make my hearing better. But I cannot blame them for my hearing loss. I, it really is family. Uh, my grandmother was so bad that I would go home and literally scream at her. If you could think about how your dog, when it jumps up on you, and you want it to really stay down, and you get tired of it jumping, almost that level of volume. Uh, so one time I went home and I thought, I don't want to scream at grandma. So I took the microphone, I took the headphones, and the big clunky type, put it on grandma, she was about 96, and she looked at me like, what in the world are you doing? And so I started at a level that I could hear out okay, and I kept turning it up, and finally I got up to number eight or nine, and I said, Grandma? And she said, I can hear you. So, of course, when she could hear me, I said, no. <laughs> right. Anyway, it's a natural. So uh, I apologize that I can't hear your question, and I ask you to repeat it. Of course, these don't help either. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm glad we have friends, and that we can uh, all wear them. So, you have any questions? Yes. Uh huh. I, I really have two questions. Um, when you were talking about the con conductor, you shared your opinions about the conductor. Mm -hmm. Is there ever a time where you can voice, uh, communicate to a conductor? Uh, what they do helps or, or doesn't help you, and did it take time to develop? If you could do that, did you take time to develop, you know, that um, level of respect or whatever, where you mm -hmm. could do that? Okay. Uh, the two people that I could do that with, Leonard Stockton and uh, David Robinson, both American conductors. Um, I think there was a level of trust, so I came and said, like we were in Detroit at uh, University of Michigan and I know Ann Arbor, and the hall was crazy. Everything was pinging, and you didn't know what to listen to. And Leonard was like, "Where am I?" You know. And so after the first piece, my assistant played the second piece, and I went backstage. I said, "What's going on?" He says, I, "I'm hearing so many different things. I don't know." What to go with? And I said, just stay with yourself and we'll be with you. Regardless of what you hear, we'll be with you. <laughs> I couldn't say that, but I was wrong. First off, you wouldn't even, I, uh, well, maybe I could have said it to him, but with Leonard, I could be very brief, very direct. With Hans, I'd have to be more di diplomatic. Uh, David Robinson would be the same way. Uh, just. You know, would you consider playing conducting in some form? Because in two, by the time we hear this section play, we're behind. And I don't know how to fix it unless you could do these measures. And he would. Because he knew <laughs> that I was thinking all the time about what would work. What would work for me, what would work for my section or the brass section. Uh, how can he make it easier for us so that we can play on time? Because that's a, very important. It's 100 people. It's not easy to do. That's why rhythm is so important in the audition. You all have to have the same concept of rhythm. So if, uh, if we're putting together a brass group like for the holiday brass concerts, we do. That's a fundraising concert I do every year. This will be, if we can have it, this will be year 30. And we raised money for the IWBC, which is the abbreviation for International Women's Rights Conference. Um, and I just tell people when they come in, and, and if it's people who don't play with us, or have never played with, I said, strict rhythm, no fancy, like, soloist approach, just very, if it's an eighth note, square eighth note, not a triplet eighth note. You know. So, uh, and they know exactly what I mean, and that, that takes care of it. Uh, the only thing is, I maybe have some more amateur level conductors like Ron Clem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, Ron Clem is a 
uh, great leader of sing-alongs. And also, he gets to the end of, of I'll give him a couple of brass pieces to conduct. And uh, why do I use him? When we started the IWBC and started having the concerts, we needed to get word out to the audience that would be interested in hearing the concerts, interested in the project, and the only way to do that was through KFUO. That was a classical station. That was the people who came to concerts. That was the people who knew me, and hopefully trusted me that I was trying to do something that would help people. So they gave me a lot of free air time, and especially for the first few years, didn't charge us anything. And of course, as we became more successful, then we would buy ads on the air. But uh, he was one of the great supporters. So after Julius Hunter didn't want to do the sing-along anymore, or, or couldn't because of his schedule, I asked Ron to do it. So Ron then gets to the end of a brass piece, and I don't know if it's the vibration of the sound coming at him. He holds the last chord forever. And I mean, I'll have to tell him, don't do that. <laughs> We've got four concerts in two days, and everybody's going to get really, really tired if you keep doing that at the end. So, you know, you have to make a few adjustments here. Okay, they said you had two questions. Yeah, I guess the, the other question was, can, can you pinpoint a time in your career where you moved from, you know, feeling like you were trying to meet the culture or whatever, fit in, to where you were being respected and, and a, a voice that people were listening to you? Well, I was always very involved with um, the, well, I don't say politics, because that's not what I mean. But, uh, you know, in a, a union organization, you have committees that are supposed to listen to uh, problems that might happen, and, and you're supposed to help solve the problems. And the problem might be that the management doesn't want to follow the contract in exactly the same way that you interpret it. And so then you have to bring the two parties together and, and, and try to do that. So I did a lot of work like that. Um, when did I feel comfortable? When they had another woman in the brass section. That was Jennifer Montone during David Robinson's time, early 2000, I think, is, is when she came. She's now principal horn in the Philadelphia Orchestra. Phenomenal player. I don't know how she did it. She just had nerves of steel. And, and you know, lots of times the horn has a lot of uh, overtones way, way up high, and, and notes are real close. You don't have a big gap where you can lock in. She never missed in that. It was just incredible. So that really helped. And now we have uh, two women in the horn section, one in the trombone section, one in the trumpet section. So St. Louis has been very uh, good to listen with their ears and not look with their eyes. No, absolutely not. Uh, conductors, for instance, you know the name Marin also. Marin is conductor of the Baltimore Symphony. She also prior to that was conductor of the Colorado Philharmonic, or Colorado Symphony. Okay, the Philharmonic, I think it's the same thing. Um, and we honored her at our 2017 conference, which was near where she lived. And we gave her a Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, and just, you know, wanted to, she was our first conductor for the Monarch Brass in 1996. So she was very, very good. And uh, we wanted to honor her for her contributions to the IWBC. And she also then, about 10 years ago, started a conductor's seminar for women conductors. And what she said that night was, you know, I thought because I had broken the ceiling and gotten a job at Baltimore as the music director of the Baltimore Symphony, I thought that that would take care of it. I thought that after that, women would be hired like crazy. And she said, I turned around after 10 years and looked, and there was no one. And I thought, I have to 
do something to change this. So she started this organization and has been doing it now for the last 15 or so years. Uh, and then the composers, there's still not a lot of women composers, and I don't know, and, and there are a lot of women composers, but I don't know them. So I don't know if they just kind of stay in their own local area, uh, but if they're fortunate enough, like Joan Tower somehow met Leonard Slankin, and he started uh, getting people to commission her for pieces for the orchestra. She did three or four uh, pieces for us, and some for the brass players, uh, called, uh, there's a fanfare for the common man. She wrote something called the fanfare for the uncommon woman. <laughs> and so, look that up, it's a valuable easy fanfare. She wrote, writes very difficult things, but uh, it's good. So, anyway, uh, I still think women are behind the composing and the conducting area. You got your hand up. Favorite song? Uh, I have a lot of favorite songs, and it just depends uh, my frame of mind, you know. Uh, last year I put on some gospel music on you because that's, I like gospel music, it's very upbeat, uh, and I felt like uh, that I personally needed some upbeat stuff <laughs> to listen to. If you're listening to Mahler, I like Mahler simply because I think. He wrote very uh, logically for the brass instruments. Uh, if you look at Beethoven, you know, bum, 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 That's the gist of our tunes to get like Beethoven's line. And then you know, Now, in all fairness, Beethoven didn't have um, the same type of instruments that we have today. So as the instruments matured and developed, the composers were able to start writing more chromatic pieces. So Berlioz is one of the first in the symphony fantastic. Has trumpet parts that are very much Beethoven. Then has cornet parts, because that's what the instrument was, was a cornet that could do the chromatics. So I have a lot of composers I like, but um, those two things, I think, come to the top, the Mahler symphonies. Uh, the only thing about Mahler is he seemed to think a lot about death. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if uh, you know, his resurrection symphony is phenomenal, uh, Mahler six, Mahler five, uh, Mahler seven of all those, but for me was the hardest, physically the hardest. So, um, and the rest were pretty much The seventh was harder because I don't know why, but up through one through six, he had the chord, uh, the way he would resolve the chords were a certain way, and you knew right where he was going to go. So from all the seventh, I practiced and practiced, but I did not practice with a recording. I just practiced on my own, because after all, I knew Mahler. I knew where everything was going to go. So the first rehearsal, I kept missing notes because the chords were not resolving the way I was expecting. Then I went home and come recording out and played with it and figured out what I was not understanding. So that was a boo-boo on my part. But it didn't fire me. The next day it was fine. Any other questions? Oh, yes, uh -huh. What do you see as like the largest or biggest challenge in funding for women in music? I bet that's a really good Maria Lane Bernard question, but she deals in fundraising. And as my understanding that says, she's extremely successful here doing that. But for women, I just think because you don't have the exposure that a, a lot of men composers or conductors or musicians get, uh, and I don't know that I can explain that. Uh, if you're a movie star and you have a lot of uh, uh, movies or places where you're on TV, seen a lot, 
probably is easy to raise money for that person. But uh, Joan Tower was an unknown uh, versus John Adams, who's very well known. So, uh, and they should both be known equally well, because I think their music is equal in quality. Uh, but when you think of composers, I think of John before I knew uh, John Tower. Now, maybe part of that is because in the last few years of my career, we played more John Adams music than we did John Tower. So, uh, but the, I think if you've got something, uh, someone like Leonard who goes and says, I want to hire this woman to write a piece, we need more woman composers, he'll find somebody in the community that would be willing to put up the money to, to pay her, because composers have to eat too. Okay? Anybody else? I would like to say something. That's not so much a question, but uh, um, I just want to say that as a younger person coming up, like learning these years tonight, um, I would go to the symphony, uh, St. Louis Symphony, and I would see you sitting there, for example, um, and uh, I would see things on the program, such as Joan Tower, I would, you know, and so my point is that um, I think that was very uh, important, and I want to thank you for the work that thank you for the work that you've done on that. I don't want, you know, just in general, because I didn't think twice about that as a young person, right? And um, it was a shock to me when I got older, and I traveled to Europe, and I would see orchestras in Europe, and it's a, there's no, there are no women in sight, you know? Uh, so that was really an eye-opening thing. So um, I always uh, took it for granted when I was younger, but now I understand what, uh, um, what an important thing that was. So I thank you for, for that and for speaking to us tonight as well. I think it's just really uh, important. I hope that it's a trend, but I, 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 I am concerned about this. You know? uh, I, I, the reason is, I think in the United States it seems to be happening. Uh, you know, more and more, but in Europe, they still seem to be sort of stuck in the mud a little bit. You, can you speak to that at all? Well, you have, uh, I don't even know if they use curtains. You have people uh, teaching in the universities who are members of, let's say, the Berlin Philharmonic or uh, Munich Philharmonic, other orchestras, and a lot of times, uh, like in Philadelphia for years, if you studied at the Curtis Institute of Music, you were invited to the auditions of the Philadelphia Orchestra, just automatically invited. Then if one of them didn't win the job, they'd open up to the, to the world. Now that's changed because I know that Jennifer Montone, who I mentioned earlier, did not go to the Curtis Institute to uh, study and she won the principal job there. So they've, had, they've opened it up, and that's, that's a good thing. In Europe, it's just still a very male-dominated thing. So uh, John Doe teaches uh, Tommy Herr, I just make this mean up, and uh, Tommy Herr plays the trumpet really, really well, and uh, so we just invite Tommy and maybe a couple other students to audition. And he wants Tommy Herr, and he says, well, I think Tommy's the best, don't you? And Maestro may say, Played very well. Yeah. I said, who you want? Yes, that's who I want. So, so the women don't have much of a chance there. But uh, there are, if you look at some of the orchestras now, there are uh, some Asian showing up in the European orchestras, and Americans lots of times could go to Europe, especially men. Uh, for instance, Chandler Getty was the principal trumpet when I first came. Chandler didn't like uh, the salary that the symphony offered him. So in 1972, in August, he said, bye bye, I'm quitting. And uh, he hadn't signed a contract, so they couldn't force him to stay. And I was the assistant at the time, and that's when he said, oh, you need to be the acting principal until we can have auditions. So Chandler went to Europe. He's going to take six months off and party, really. And uh, when he got over there, he had some openings for trumpet. One was in the Bavarian Radio Orchestra, which they would play concerts on the radio every week. And uh, he auditioned, probably not even expecting 
to win the job, because he was American, and he won the job. So it was a co-principal job. So in the summertime, he talked the other guy into playing principal for the summer, so he could go back to Santa Fe, where his family lived, and play in the opera there, Santa Fe Opera. In the wintertime, the other guy liked to go skiing. <laughs> so he would play the winter season, and the guy would go skiing. So it was perfect in a lot of ways. But Chandler won that job, and his wife was an oboe English horn player. And Susan Getty won the English horn position in the Munich Radio Orchestra. So they both had government jobs, high-paying jobs. Uh, and, you know, they both now have come back to the States, live in Wisconsin. Chandler gave up the trumpet and took up the French horn. He was now a principal horn in the something something community band. And he, he loves it. Does the horn so much easier to play? <laughs> so, you know, thank you, Dwight, for your kind words. And uh, yeah, if, uh, hopefully it'll, it'll change, but uh, it takes time. And if you look at the IWBC, it's been in existence about 28, 29 years now, we're nearing 30. And uh, we're seeing more women, uh, not only featured at other conferences, but also in uh, teaching positions, major teaching positions. Uh, a couple of gals won positions at North Texas State University, and that was all men up until a couple of years ago. Uh, it's just, uh, it's changing. It, it may take another two generations and another hundred years in Europe, but hey, it's progress. Okay, well, thank you all. Speak now or forever.